Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Engage Payers with Patient Value to Streamline Pathways to Access. We are in the, you are in the right place, and the discussion will begin in shortly. I'm just going to give another minute for more people to join the room. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Maria Belen Moran, joining you from Ingelheim, Germany. Welcome to today's webinar. We were we where we'll discuss payer engagement, legislation, value generation, and more. During this session, you will be here from industry experts who will share their learnings on where to start, where to go, thinking big and thinking small. This is an interactive webinar, so please let us know in the chat box where are you tuning in from, and be sure to use the question and answers function so we can ask your questions to the expert panel. Now, let's learn a little bit more about our speakers and who they are, starting with uh, Diego. Welcome. Hi. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Diego Cortina. I'm based out of the US and um, I'm currently the director for evidence value generation within the Biogen Global Value and Access Team. My day-to-day -day job is to look at early pipeline products and um, everything uh, in regards to uh, payer engagement and particular endpoints that we can include. Um, just a small, Disclaimer, uh, the opinions that you will hear today are my own and do not reflect the opinions of Biogen company whatsoever. Thank you. Dushita. Hi, everybody. Hi, my name is Dushita Hajibashkovic. Um, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining the webinar. I am the director of Global Value and Real World Evidence with Atsuka Pharmaceutical Development and Commercialization. Um, I do support CNS products and digital medicine from inline uh, products to early development into phase two. Um, and here today, really happy to join and also present my own beliefs and uh, values, views and opinions uh, as not representing or speaking on behalf of Atsuka Pharmaceutical Industry or Atsuka Pharmaceutical Development and Commercialization, neither Atsuka America or affiliates. Thanks for joining. Thank you. So I will open with uh, one question for all uh, for all of us. <laughs> if you can answer, how are you leading market access in your role, and what strategies and collaborative approaches are vital for pharma to engage with payers early in the drug development process to streamline access pathways for patients? So the the Hi, I um I am. I'm part of global value and real world evidence team. So I collaborate really closely with market access and try to develop the content to really inform the payers, the HDA bodies globally and um, more so US to say because of the com complexity of the market with the intention to inform on the best value and access pathway for the products and the benefits to the patients. How we do that, uh, we provide relevant real world evidence in support of the existing clinical trials or the existing clinical evidence and the body of literature its whole. Great, Diego, yourself. Um, well, I work as a global, uh, a part of the global value and access team in, in this new division called um, Evidence Value Strategy. Um, and how I collaborate with uh, our internal key stakeholders is we have a cross-functional team from research and 
uh, development, clean uh, cleanups, and regulatory and finance. So it's it, it's 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 a really cross functional team, and I work within the pipeline team. So we we take a look at, at the assets all the way from the early stages of the development um, to about eighteen months prior to launch, in which we then turn over our our assets to an area called the International Center of Excellence, and they they take care of the. Uh, launch and, ex and, and and execution of it. And my main role is to try to include in the clinical trials very specific outcomes that will make sense for the patients and for the payers. Um, I'm currently working with rare and ultra rare uh, diseases. So it becomes extremely important to really pinpoint um, what what are the unmet needs and, and what will really resonate with our uh, uh, external um, key stakeholders. And what we've seen in the past is that it's it's a lot easier if you include the answers to the questions from the very beginning that at a later stage, you need to then redo some of the work in order to address those um, specific questions. I have a question about the, the how early is for you too early? Uh, when when exactly to start? Because a lot of us start uh, du during the clinical trial or during even phase one uh, when we want to, to start. So Dushita, what do you think? When is too early? Well, that that's typically we say never, like it's never too early to engage. And I think, you know, like from, from Diego's perspective, probably his, you know, uh, time is well spent on early, early development. I share almost equally between inline products to phase two to three. And then I also have some opportunities that I collaborate with our early translational science and uh, the BD teams to really scope, um, help them address the epidemiology and the um, payer landscape, so to speak, on particular um, um, potential assets. Uh, or compounds in early stage development, preclinical stage. So, you know, it, it starts, it varies from early insights and early um, consultation to the uh, early pipeline to actually enforcing the integrated value strategic evidence plans, as Diego mentioned, to phase two and three, because some things are critical and pivotal that have to be captured from either scales that uh, could be translated into meaningful uh, use or meaningful clinical uh, change differentiation in the market as the as the product will get regulatory approval and you cannot reverse and go back. And sometimes a successful launch or differentiation really depends on that additional um, secondary endpoint that simply um, could have been missed if you know we haven't assessed that from the market access perspective and how payers will value beyond typical research scales that are um, to be designed and communicating to the HCPs. Right, Diego. No, yeah, I mean, I I I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, there's, it's it's uh, um, the the earlier the better and 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 we are even doing a, a very early payer engagement because we've also understand that payers and different stakeholders don't need to know it all so there's mm -hmm. a lot of also education that needs to go on and 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 that's where as as you say that epidemiology piece is also extremely important because you need to 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 help them understand uh, about that current unmet need and also what could that potentially reflect into um, some sort of um, budget constraints that they might have. And because one of the main questions that they're always going to ask is, okay, we are tapping into an unmet need, but um, how big of a hit am I going to get in my budget? So the earlier that you can work with them, um, the better. And and I think in the past, we saw the payers as um, sort of like a hurdle. And I think nowadays we see them as a crucial partner. And and not only the payers, but also the, the, the patients 
as well, because what we produce has to make sense not only for the patients, but also for the patients and the, and the caregivers even. Great. Now that we are talking about patients, I'm going to to read a question that we have in the in the questions and answers uh, chat box. That is, uh, would uh, would love to hear from the panel on what bodies are setting good example for patient involvement. What can we learn from them? So um, yeah, either of you. I can take this. You know, I can I, I can give it a try. Um, and this is reflects on, I think, mostly from the mental health perspective. Uh, there is a lot of engagements with patient advocacy groups, um, and I'm not going to main name them because I don't want to leave any behind or not misrepresent um, any. But um, there is a, a to say a hybrid environment uh, in the last few years that it's really grooming around FDA to really bring the what is the patient perspective and patient voice within reflecting on the development of the medications. Um, and we see it really now with DEI um, and the NIH grants really being respective of um, vulnerable and protective subjects. Uh, FDA is also on the COA front really um, spearheading to understand what is really meaningful um, change with any appropriate uh, measurement and scale that will reflect on, um, you know, positive impact on the therapy or new uh, new uh, solutions coming to to the market, as well as we're um, trying uh, to engage the caregivers with many um, diseases. We're really recognizing that they are equally important stakeholder and equally impacted, if sometimes not even more than the patients. So many of the measurements are getting. Um, tweaked and revised and modified to really address the pair, the caregiver burden and caregiver perspective on um, when we are trying to evaluate and develop further some specific scales. Great. We are talking about a lot of stakeholders, and uh, it means that we also need a cross-functional team, and we need uh, teams that understand the perspectives of the stakeholders, the different that they are. So how can we make our access teams to go above and beyond by providing additional evidence that meets the gold standard? Are, are there new models of evidence generations besides traditional head-to-head uh, -head, uh, trials? We know they are, but uh, do we have examples on how can we embrace um, our teams and make them go above and beyond? I can, I can, I can take... This one and, and and I think this is a this is a very good question and and to me and, and and I've always said that it is very important to have every key stakeholder sitting down at the table to be able to um communicate what we really want to communicate and 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 to really tap into those unmet needs. Um and a practical example is I I, I worked once with um um a disease called sickle cell disease, and and this this is a this is a disease that affects a very specific patient population. That not only it it is in relationship with a race, but also with a socioeconomic state. So, um, what it was extremely important is was to work with the government in itself on on that and um before even the the drug that was tackling sickle cell disease was approved into the market we needed to understand what were really the unmet needs did they have um a specific um diagnostics in in place what sort of treatment were were they using what sort of budget was it really allocated to it and and we needed to work hand in hand to ensure that regardless of who was in charge at that point in time, we will secure the continuity mm -hmm. of the project itself. So we worked years in advance of a product being launched into the market to secure that everything was in place for that product to launch because we were tapping into issues like we don't even have roads to get that product to the rural clinics, 
for um, example. So this was um, um, very different from your uh, clear or your average evidence sort of generation uh, strategy that you needed to to provide to to the to the countries because we were risk sharing not only on the efficacy of the product but also we were risk sharing on the on the budget that was really going to be at, mm -hmm. um, allocated to it so um i mean that's 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 one example of 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 a thing that actually worked yeah okay thank you the mm -hmm. in your um, experience payers like to have compelling head to head comparative data uh, what do you do when you need to show comparative effectiveness for payers when there's a lack of studies, of comparative studies? Yeah, well, that, that's a good problem to have, <laughs> to start with that, <laughs> honestly. Uh, payers, I think we have uh, many of us who have engaged with payers at, you know, either as an ad board or um, conference uh, networking or um, a live customer meetings would understand and know probably that payers uh, would not put a high value on clinical trials that are placebo controlled uh, because simply that's not that's, that doesn't reflect or inform them on the real world and how the product could be potentially landing um, in real world in routine care. With that in mind, they would uh, really look for uh, look forward or try themselves if the sponsor will not provide or if the body of evidence is not really uh, making a case for head to head real world comparative studies such mm -hmm. as comparative effectiveness, cost effectiveness, um, and beyond modeling into actual um, retrospective or prospective um, observational studies or cohort studies itself. Uh, with that in mind, if you do have a um, um, uh, variety of comparative studies available, um, you know, the, uh, um, net, uh, the network meta-analysis or the systematic meta-analysis will be, you know, interesting and a key to provide really the objective um, um, a palette and rainbow of evidence that it's, uh, that it's out in the literature and not really reflect only on the sponsor's evidence generation plan. But if that is not the case, typically the sponsors will have to um, uh, demonstrate and execute studies on their own mm -hmm. in support of prior to launch as they anticipate uh, or try to make a case for differentiation. And that could be anything, like I said, from claims retrospective database analysis in US found mostly, which payers do really heavily rely on because they are managing a population um, unique to them or to that indication space. And they would have to analyze for their simply budget management or annual budget planning uh, their own claims. Um, and if we leave that uh, up to, uh, if if the sponsor is actually not trying to address the totality of the, of the population that might be impacted. If that is the case, and you know, we did, we did actually provided that prevalence or incidence um, impact on their cost of the plan. That's always um, ultimate goal for the payer to see the impact of that particular medication or compared to some other medication within the same class. Um, the other techniques or designs such as the prospectives or the registries um, are really interesting to the payers. But I think what's critical and what we have found probably, I don't know if Diego would agree with me, they like to be informed ahead of time. Mm -hmm. We like mm -hmm. to see this as being tested with them to understand how this really, how close to their population this is, and how is this really addressing their current budget and treatment unmet needs. Uh, if that is not the case, you know, disseminating something that it's fully developed and published already might not always meet their standards and their needs. So engaging them ongoing on uh, on continuous basis is always you know critical and uh, I think much more rewarding in the end. Super, thank you. Diego, I have a, a, a I don't know, an ongoing question on this one because uh, real world evidence is uh, on on our um, uh, vocabulary every time. And uh, it, it makes us think how, um, and, and I'm coming from a question that I have in the, in the questions and answers uh, box that is how, has real world evidence uh, in, uh, incorporated into trials to mitigate the access barriers, but also 
what to do if the uh, payers do not accept real world evidence because they are, I don't know, traditional. <laughs> that's a, that's. Are, well, there that's are two questions. Good, yeah, no, and <laughs> those are both very good questions. So I'll I'll try to answer the second one first, which which was what would happen if payers don't accept real world evidence because they're too traditional. Mm -hmm. Um. If we go back to traditional ways of engaging payers or what sort of information do they like, they will always want to see um, the health economics piece of it. Um, and and because the question that they have on their mind usually is, how much is this going to cost me? Mm -hmm. um, but for us to be able to do that, we need to also talk about the other part of it, which is the clinical piece of it, because I'm not only talking okay, this will cost you X amount of dollars. But I also need to say, because I'm not talking, let me take a step back. I'm not talking about a product. I'm not talking, I'm, I'm talking about a patient that has a disease that costs you in, on average X, Y, or Z amount of dollars a year. You're currently treating this patients with X, Y, or Z treatments. And what we're trying to provide to you is an answer to this unmet need that could potentially then reduce the costs in A, Y, and Z because our efficacy shows blah, blah, blah. Now, there's there's a big difference between what you show on a clinical trial and what you show what the product is out there in the in the market. Real. Yeah. So yeah. So so I think it's sort of less hard to convince the payers with that real world evidence because you're letting them know this is not on a, on a controlled environment. This is what happens when that product hits the marketplace and you're faced with all the different constraints, whether there's a high copy, where there is a dropout rate because of the side effects or the new entry of the uh, generics, or the off-label use of X, Y, or Z. So that level of evidence um, only allows payers to make a more informed decision, I would say. Now, I forgot about the first question, so maybe you can <laughs> repeat it to me. So the first question, the first question was uh, um, how to incorporate into trials real-world mm -hmm. evidence to mitigate the, the access for years. Since the beginning, real world evidence, how? Well, um, you need to un understand what are currently those um, unmet needs and what are those gaps that need to be filled. And the further ahead you sort of try to um, tackle them, the easier. And and that's when you, you get the patient voice involved also from the beginning and the caregiver voice also. And we're also seeing in the clinical trials that um, some or a lot of them are including an, a long-term efficacy analysis. So so you have your, your current months or years that a clinical trial will, but then you have an arm of, of a patient that will go for their longer because Payers will also like to see what happens to the patients that go on the medication and remain on them for a longer period of time than what is ex, um, expected, but because you're also talking about some of the chronic cut diseases. Okay, I have a I have an, um, a question specific for for you, Dushitsa, that is uh, from your experience and your medical device uh, background. When it comes to commercialization of innovative medicines, how do you navigate? IDNs and uh, PROs, especially when payers haven't valued these to date, but uh, they are now. Yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah, so I, I wear two hats. In, um, in my prior life, uh, I've been going from pharma pharmaceutical manufacturers to the medical uh, device uh, manufacturers um, and, um, and do have that kind of broader lens on who do we consider a payer or traditional HDA body or Ministry of Health versus the IDNs, as you mentioned. So within the United States, the integrated delivery networks, which stands for IDNs, are really the 
conglomerate of the hospitals or the network of the hospitals that we negotiate the access for medical devices, for example, as we were talking. And it's very different um, presentation of the value of the value prop and more economically driven than for traditional uh, pharmaceutical products uh, medications in mind. With that in mind, uh, IDNs really look at the um, 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 medical device manufacturers as a partners to Diego's earlier point. They don't see this as a hurdle. They see as a partner because they have unmet need. They have workflow issues. They have operational costs, losses that they're not trying to, they're trying to really manage the patient's hospitalization and the length of stay as effective and as budgetary uh, planned as, um, you know, as they can. So, because they're still pro for profit run business um, in general, in totality, and they are responsible for providing care within that uh, local community or the region uh, or specialized care institutions. So with that in mind, really it becomes state of art of like how do we communicate capital investment to them and portfolio from like enterprise level um, dissemination of broader solutions and really try to explain how the, the journey, the patient journey and patient care pathway will be impacted by certain devices or the, uh, the solutions that we provide for them from um, workflow efficiency, operational cost um, gains, or better treatment uh, clinical outcomes. Super. So um, Diego, this is uh, coming into the practice and maybe you can uh, you can tell us a little of uh, what are examples of success and non-successful integration of patient views and perceptions in evidence generation, generation sorry, leading to positive access decisions for innovative medicines lately? Um, good question. And um, I think an example of a success story um, could be, and Lucita was mentioning at the beginning, the new and upcoming treatments for mental health. Mm -hmm. um, we've come to understand that this has become a public health issue and that it has gained a lot of attention from very different key stakeholders. Uh, stakeholders. Um, and the sooner we can get the patient voice in it and the sooner that we can understand what are the benefits that are actually hitting those patients and how are they reacting to it? And in essence, how is this translated into benefits to the society itself? Then it brings a stronger argument when we talk to the rest of us uh, of the stakeholders. Because let's let's remember that with with a health issue such as, this one, you're not only tapping into the resources that are, are allocated for the treatment itself, but also resources that are allocated to the absenteeism mm -hmm. that is provoked by this, not only for the patient, but also for the caregivers. So, so a good success story is how this has also been in forums such as the, the UN, I think it was last year when the... Um, um, ambassador of Mexico at that point in time raised this, this issue and sort of allowed to other countries to come together and really uh, uh, pinpoint what were the current needs and uh, uh, sort of try to get the different governments together to sort of um, um, tackle the, the, the mental health problem. Now, uh, on the other hand, a non-success story could be to try to generalize mm. that there's an issue or, or the same issue is for every market. So no, we, we, have, we have diseases that are not related to gender, race, age group, and so on and so forth. But, but more frequently as the research and development of the diseases itself is, 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 is really digging deeper, 
we are finding that some diseases, yes, they are related to gender, to race, to um, um, uh, countries or, or, or what have you. So to try to really have one strategy that will um, be efficacious, um, efficacious to every market or to think that the patient needs are the same in every market, that, that is something that it's not going to have a positive outcome for sure. Super, thank you. We have um, a lot of questions in the in the chat, but uh, anyways, this is one that is it comes um, um, with a question that we already been thinking about and is how is pharma thinking about value outcome-based contracts for innovative medicines? But I would like to, to understand um, in this, Make me make the same question to the Shitsa on what is uh, works and what doesn't work. From the value based contract thing, sure. I I welcome this question because I think it's involvement. It's great to see the development of value based contract thing for like you know a decade ago that um it was you know most of the sponsors will shy away and really stay away because it was not only that it's uncharted territory but it was too slow to start and really set up the value-based contract. I think, you know, it's picking up now, especially in the United States, it becomes, you know, alternative to protect access or gain quickly access. Uh, and it's a risk sharing, right? Between the, the payer and the sponsor. Ultimately that is. Um, I think, um, you know, now it's becoming to value-based contracting 2.0, and that is to really tweak the the uh, decisions on the endpoints or the impact to be measured as opposed to the uh, setting up the value based contract as uh, as it was in the past. So uh, it's I think you know the value based contract thing it, it's not going to go away. And with the um, new legislation such as you know um, IRA uh, coming in, you know ICER becoming more prominent in the United States um, and other. Um, uh, government affairs uh, um, activities with the various companies and pharma rallying around uh, really informing the 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 political body and it's all um, you know it's going to be one of the uh, valuable channels to really communicate and to um, effectively demonstrate the value of the product by also uh, trying to secure the access or better positioning with the portfolio uh, portfolio management. Super. Now we have a, a one that you, you talk about the, the United States and uh, we have a specific one that is uh, we have seen dialing back on PAP programs, lowering uh, FPL thresholds across products, many of whom unaffected by IRA. What is the access strategy shift for these patients? Do you have an answer? Do you think um, it is super specific and we need to just see what is what will be going on with uh, IRA? <laughs> I can I can try. Like you know, the, this is not nobody has you know an answer, and it's still very early to say what the ARA it, it, the effect is going to be. We know what has been communicating and what's you know as of today will be in effect and that is the medic the you know redesign of Medicare Part D and uh controlling the maximum price uh, um market price for the top 10 uh selected um CMS Medicare um uh, the drugs what will be the you know will there be a spillover effect will there be uh consequences and additional impact to the other segments of the payers mm -hmm anticipate but I, I don't think you know that's very skeptical and very early to debate or or uh, or criticize or really um discuss in detail because we simply don't have enough of um information and evidence actually how impactful will it be uh it's very guessing game so to speak in this moment uh for for all of us you know on the sponsor side as well on the payer side that are getting the most impact from this legislation um we understand why um you know there was a need for such uh within you know uh within the inflation uh, rate rising and the 
also healthcare crisis uh, that is upon us, uh, in, you know, like in the United States. So something had some action had to be taken to prevent that further uh, from happening. But, um, you know, specifics on the patient assistance programs um, are the, you know, impact on those are maybe, you know, reflecting on the current sponsor uh, strategy needs or might be long-term effect across the industry. We still don't know yet of, you know, how would um, um, uh, the industry shift. We know mm -hmm. that data already suggests that the R&D um, support will not drop significantly. That stayed flat in the last 10 years, and it's trending to be that case. Uh, we know that the cost from the, uh, from the revenue and operational profit is shifting, um, you know, because it's declining and it will be, have to be offset in some other ways, but it's, I think, too early to say in specifics, how would that be um, demonstrated and rolled up in the, in the affected markets? And we'll say this. What is your, what is your <laughs> stance on this? But, um, you know, it's very speculations at the moment still. Yeah, yeah, no. And, 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 and I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, it's, it's, we are at a, at a very early stage. I mean, the, the IRA started in 2022. So, so it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's way too early to see what, what the, the, the big impact will, will be. I mean, as, and, and as you said, it was logical that this sort of, um, shift would, needed to happen because Medicare is where bulk of the budget goes. Um, and, and it, it's, it's also, it was also expected because you're, you're talking about aging population with chronic diseases that, that stay on the medication for a long period of, of uh, time. And that hits the, the U S healthcare budget in, 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 in much. I mean, I mean, we're, we're doing early, assessments year, I mean, since 2022 on what could potentially be the impact. And I'm talking about uh, medications that will hit the marketplace in 2030, 2032. But, but as you say, I mean, there's, there's only speculations. I think as the years go by, we will have a much clearer understanding on where we are, but in regards to the patient assistance programs, and that's, that's a good point. I was, um, I, I was in a conversation a few months ago with 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 uh, the 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 ICER also in the in the in the U.S. and they were talking about the patient assistance programs and also the role of the uh, mm -hmm. generics and and um, how uh, the the incoming of the generics into the marketplace is something that is here that is here to stay and that we might as well get get used to it. And, as an industry, as an individual, as a patient, as everyone. Now, one of the key issues and what the researchers and, and the people from the, the ICER was saying is, yes, it's good that we're welcoming the generics, but at the end of the day, the patients are not able to keep up with the generics because most of the times those generics companies do not have the patient assistance programs, which a bulk of it goes to the to the copay assistance program. So you're again talking about patients that need to pay a copay of of twenty dollars or thirty dollars. That for some might mean nothing, but but a lot of them means a lot. So so then the the the, the question that the researchers were saying is is this benefiting ultimately the patients or is it benefiting that person or the institution that holds the budget? Because if the entry of some medications into the marketplace and the lower cost of them will, or or the, the whole idea behind it is that it will benefit the, the patient, then there, there is some work that needs to be done to ensure that that actually goes to the patient at this and does not stay only with with the budget holder do you think it's the same what the what is going on with the reforms in europe ah. <laughs> 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 that's an interesting question and and i think in essence yes be, be, because those reforms are also um targeted to try to con to con contain costs as as 
much as possible. And and again, I think it's too early to 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 actually see what will be the potential effect. But this is not going away, and it's understandable because we're an aging population. And with with that, I mean, thankfully we're living a much longer life in about a month and a half. My grandmother is going to turn. 99 so and 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 she's in good health but but what i'm trying to say is that as we go get older there's also diseases that did not happen in the past that are more <laughs> prevalent now that when the budgets were allocated at some point in time or when they were thought of they did not take this into account so there's there's something that needs to be done yes or yes so this is not going away anytime soon, so. <laughs> Good, thank you. Dushitsa, what do you think, uh, or what would you say is the importance of uh, ad advocating for more involvement of patient voices in engaging payers from the earliest stages? Could you share any experience, and also Diego, on the, um, um, you've had in uh, proactively involving patient caregiver voices from the outset in engagement payers. Have you worked with patient advocacy organizations to drive this? This is a question from the chat. That's why it's so long, but you can read it there if you want. <laughs> yeah, sure. I, I think, you know, it goes such a long way if, we, if the sponsor will invest into engaging and working closely, collaborating with the patient advocacy. Sometimes, you know, from that starts from the clinical development or the regulatory path and you know if you anticipate you know the outcome or the patient voice has to be embedded as a patient advocate patient ambassador with you know endorsement of the of the of the clinical submission on the clinical program submission but engaging them with the payers uh, uh it's really critical because for example payers in the united states do value social determinants of health and they started valuing that and being more receptive of posters, publications, any um, um, public information, evidence to be presented decade ago almost, uh, as opposed to really physicians starting to be as mindful as prescribing to certain socio, socio, uh, socio uh, determinants of health. Um, so we see that still, um, you, you know, not settlement within the stakeholders and, and to say customers in general that would need to be mindful of patient needs, patient's perception and patient understanding of how this fits in their daily life living, you know, as this new treatment is in uh, is rolled in, on, onto them. Uh, but we, we do engage uh, for example, in neurology now and more like aging elderly population with dementia, with Alzheimer's disease, uh, you do have really critical engagement from caregivers. So it's not only patients, but you have patient advocacy on uh, from caregiver perspective. And that's critical um, to understand that even payers are starting to understand that that's critical piece to actually be successful uh, implementation of that um, of that medication to be uh, on the formulary um, and, and to really be effective of you know preventing long-term care or institutionalizing those patients and really um, affecting that dwelling communities. Um, so yes, there are successful stories. Uh, and I think mental health, uh, oncology, uh, some of the rare diseases that do affect the community or really that broader care network of patients, friends, uh, family members uh, are really critical to um, um, have that voice in, uh, included or that stakeholder included uh, in the not only submission, but then to the payer um, evidence package. Yeah, now that we are talking about um, non-traditional stakeholders, because we are talking about, of course, patients now are traditional for for uh, industry, but maybe caregivers are new in the in the um, in the game. But now th there's a question on another non-traditional. So, how are market access strategies uh, focused on the employer groups who support uh, sponsor health uh, plans? There is certainly, certainly a great need to address patient access and affordability, but much of that friction can be addressed by meeting the challenges of employer access and affordability. They, after all, 
in most instances are true end payers of pharmaceutical goods. What do you think? So for me, if I can uh, um, comment on this, I think that, uh, as I said, it's a um, non-traditional um, stakeholder for us, but at the end it's a payer. So uh, we can say that, uh, yes, we need to start working on different uh, stakeholders and start seeing the care pathway as a whole care pathway, not only in the healthcare system, also around the healthcare system. There are the more, uh, much more decision makers that we uh, sometimes uh, mapped. So uh, um, I think it's a good, uh, it's, a, it's a good idea. I don't know, Diego, uh, the Shitsa. Yeah, I was, I was. I was trying to think when when you mentioned the word employer, I I thought of two types of employers. One are the employers that are the employers for a lot of us, which are big multinational companies, but also there are employers in which they provide access to healthcare in the public health healthcare systems. So, so, so there's, there's, there's two completely different discussions there, for the multinational companies that provide health benefits to their employees. It all has to do with the different insurance companies, and 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 what those insurance companies will actually provide as benefits to the patient, not only in the medication but also. In hospitalization, in 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 um, home uh, care, and what have you. But then you have the other part of it, which is um, companies in those countries that have a public healthcare system. And 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 I'm Mexican, so for example, the IMSS or the ISTE, which is for the state workers. Yes, the companies provide patients access to that. But we see most of the time that not all of the institutions have everything they need to provide an adequate um, treatment options for the patients. And that that is well beyond what a pharmaceutical company can, can potentially do. That's, that's budget that comes from the states or from the federal uh, government that regardless whether you reduce the cost of the medication then you come up with any sort of agreement or cost sharing agreements with the institutions if you don't have the rest of the budget there then it becomes mm -hmm. increasingly tougher for a patient to receive what is necessary and it's something that everyone should be entitled to which is the best healthcare attention there so yeah going back on how do we prepare ourselves um can you tell me how can we elevate the industry to prepare for graded uncertainty in the payer reimbursement and uh, approval landscape how do we prepare ourselves yeah. yes so to to me it comes again to the earlier the engagement the better the early the earlier I could understand what keeps you up at night, what makes you tick. I mean, in regards to budgetary reasons, not if you have a toddler at home that would not go to bed. But uh, in, I mean, the, the better, because then I can partner with you to make sure that not only your needs are met, but also the patient population needs are met. This is an ever-changing environment. And it's not becoming easier. It's becoming increasingly harder. I mean, I remember 20, 20 years ago, uh, if you could pro uh, provide just a small health economic model to the authorities, they would say, oh yeah, that's good. Okay, you're... now this is not even thinkable. I mean, you need to come up with a much stronger arguments that will move the needle to the decision-making process. So this is this is why the earlier you can have those conversations, the better. I mean, I'm starting to have early payer engagement conversations with products on phase one. Mm -hmm. Does sure. it make sense? Am I going to be setting up a final price for the product? No. 
but at least I can understand, do they even know about the disease, the issue, the epidemiology, the potential budget impact that this could have? Yes, no. And if they don't, can we work with them? Because the other issue is you come up with the epi data and you say, okay, this is what's going on with X disease in your country. This is a patient population. This is the resource utilization that you're having. And you can have one of two answers. Oh my God, yes, this is great. I, I believe you or nah. Ah, I, I, because I've had those those uh, sort of comments from uh, uh, patients. Now this is a disease that it's it doesn't happen in in my country. Okay, so could we partner with your epidemiologists just to make sure and to double check that this is really an issue? And if there's if and if there is such an issue, then how can we work together to address that? issue. But if you do it, once you're about to launch the product, and as um, 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 Lucicia was, was saying, you have already everything in place, your value proposition, your your um, all your outcomes in place, and you're just going to show them and you're going to expect them to say, yeah, this is great. Come on in. No, that's it's 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 much more harder to to happen. Yeah, this webinar is about engagement with the, with the payers, it says, but I'm thinking on uh, we should go beyond the payers. What do you think uh, about it, Dushitsa? Uh, yes, we said patients, we already said caregivers. Where are other stakeholders that we should go beyond and they have the decision maybe in their hands? Yeah, that that's, that, you know, Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, to just uh, go back, uh, you know, one question back to your uh, employer engagement. And, yeah. you know, um, just my, my observation, my experience on large employers within um, the multinational companies to, to Diego's point, those conglomerates, or to say that um, in, in decade ago, they started off wellness, well-being programs for their employees, um, sometimes country specific, sometimes multinational, global. And they started with a chronic disease, general disease, like with diabetes, hypertension, then asthma, COPD. Um, some had the breast cancer prevalence um, or, pardon me, uh, preventative programs or, um, you know, some specific uh, oncology needs for their employees within certain countries that are more prevalent um, to those. But what we see lately is more receptivity of the large payers to actual uh, needs of their workers or, you know, their uh, well-being. So that really puts the mental health at the forefront because they understand nowadays, to Diego's point, patients are living longer, patients are experiencing diseases that were not treatable or not even uh, diagnosable uh, 10, 20 years ago. So uh, it's broadening also the, the views and horizon and the impact that the uh, large employers do have on the productivity because it's not only that uh, you know, some chronic diseases that are really severe would impact their you know, productivity and overall uh, engage um, engagement from the from their uh, you know, from the from the employees, but also it's their overall health and uh, you know and mental health is that underlying condition that really uh, impacts significantly, but it's not easy to detect or see. So we do have um, you know really more proactive now and more engaged discussions with large employers and them valuing and recognizing the the need of addressing or somewhat trying to uh, prevent or um, or control the mental health um, as to their best cap capabilities. Uh, to now fast, fast forward to your current question, and that is what are the additional stakeholders or, you know, beyond that, um, patients, caregivers. Um, I think, you know, we also are bringing the voice to the legislations legislators, you know, decision makers, the policy decision makers. Uh, many companies do have the 
uh, design teams beyond their mm-hmm. corporate communications or government affairs teams into specific real world evidence, policy implications or impact to the decision making. As I mentioned, the social determinants of health is rising. Uh, it's recognized, you know, from a regulatory standpoint, we do have now FDA that is trying setting up the framework and there is existence uh, path for RWE, which is real world evidence, pardon me for using the acronym, um, pathway for regulatory acceptance with the submission. Of course, it's still in early um, in early stage, so it's more, um, uh, it was designed purposely for oncology solutions and rare or ultra rare, but we'll see probably that being adopted for uh, um, other across different therapeutic areas and specific diseases of the to meet the needs uh, of RWE inclusion with the submission package. Great. We have uh, four more minutes, so I'm going to give you two and two minutes or maybe less <laughs> um, to say a final statement about how to engage payers with the patient value to streamline pathways to access. Diego. Um, well, First of all, I want to thank everyone uh, for taking an hour from your day to be with us. I hope this was um, helpful. Um, to, to me, it has been a great um, experience. So also, thanks so much for the organizers. Um, I guess my main takeaway will be don't be afraid to engage early. Don't be afraid to ask questions. There's no better way to get an answer than to ask the question. So the earlier you do that, the better, and the easier it will be for the patients to get their treatment. Because at the end of the day, that's what we're here for, to ensure that the patients receive their treatment. So just don't be afraid to ask the questions. Thank you. The sheet's on. Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks everybody for um, joining the webinar. Thanks Diego and Maria and Reuters for a um, great panel and uh, great discussion. I really enjoyed. And I think you know my main takeaway is if you put patient as a center and the benefit to the patient, the value prop is an easier task or the evidence to support either the submission or the access um, um, or the management of the current access uh, is much more streamlined and clear uh, in the thought of observer as uh, everybody, I think, will come to the table and agree that we are all trying to provide um, solutions or medications or devices to really address the advancements for uh, individual patients and meet their needs uh, into um, finding a cure or uh, making their well-being. Thank you. Thank you, Dushitsa. I also um, um, enjoy the this conversation. I think it passed uh, very fast for me. I, I didn't even realize how how fast the uh, time uh, went. I um, I hope I included all the questions uh, that were in the in the chat box. I tried to do it and to put in uh, in some other questions that we already have prepared for the panelists. And uh, I'm super happy that everybody had a little alignment on uh, what to do on or maybe some questions that we um, every day ask and we want to know from the experts. So thank you very much, much um, the two of you, to for sharing all this good experience and, and uh, all your knowledge. I'm, I think that uh, in summary, we need to engage, as uh, Diego says, uh, as early, better, and engage with the proper stakeholders, um, try to bring the, the value that they want to, to hear about, including real world evidence, of course. Um, the patient as a center, as the Dushitsa the, the said, it is uh, important and also include other, um, maybe no so traditional stakeholders to keep engaged because this is something to, important to engage and keep engaged. So um, nothing more. Thank you very much uh, for all of you to, um, to uh, come to this webinar. And uh, as they have said, all the hour here with us uh, sharing a lot of knowledge. Thank you, and I hope we can see each other again soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Have a